there we are. Okay, today is a difficult sermon to do for me, and I know I say it probably every time we meet, but, but um, let's look at Galatians. It says, where Paul warns the Christians in, in Galatia, which is now present-day Turkey, South Galatia, Galatia at least, where he says, if somebody comes and preach a different gospel, may he or she be cursed. But the, the point I want to make is that even and the, the first of the letter to the Galatian church were probably written in 41, 49 AD. Is what's probably one of the first letters Paul ever wrote. This was like 19 years after the death and resurrection of Christ. And there was already false gospels circulating and false preaching. Can you imagine 2,000 years later where we are today? And one of my key duties is to warn you against potential false gospels. I'll be a very poor, um, almost said farmer, shepherd, but a farmer, if I didn't warn my sheep about potential false gospels that are dangerous. And one of the false gospels that you know that is very prevalent in the postmodern era is the gospel of all religions are the same. And every different religion is just a different way to God and we all serve the same God. It's not true. It's one true religion and one true living God. So I want to speak today specifically about Islam. Why do I want to speak about Islam? Because the spreading, the fastest growing religion currently is Islam. If you go and Google it, it's the fastest growing religion worldwide. There are thousands and, well, thousands, millions of immigrants moving into previously Christian Europe. They call them immigrants. I call them invaders, but that's a different sermon. Um, and there's a lot of Mid and North Africa Islamic people moving south. Who have read about a month back about the extremist Muslim attacks in the north of Mozambique? Yeah. It's a few hours drive away from us. Don't think this doesn't affect you. And most Christians, and I say this with kindness, I'm not pointing at you, I'm talking about Christians in general, don't have a cooking clue what Islam is about. And because in the Quran they refer to Moses and Abraham and Mary and John the Baptist and to their version of Jesus, they call him Isa, people think, oh, it's just a different view on, on, on Christianity. Nothing can be the furthest from the truth. Isa, like a sire, Isa. Okay, so I'm going to reflect on Islam. And I'm not here to, 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 to make you angry with your Muslim neighbor. Or make you irritated with your Muslim colleague. We all know pleasant, socially pleasant Muslims. I've in my life encountered socially pleasant Muslims. I'm here to warn you against the political dogma of Islam. Because in Islam, it's not like Christianity where a religion and state is separated. Where Islam is the majority religion, it's the state's religion. In Islam, politics and religion is never separated like we often find in Christian countries. And let me give you this analogy. Knowing a friendly, kind, socially nice Muslim, and I have no doubt there are many decent, nice Muslims, it's like going to a crocodile farm and meeting a little pet crocodile of two days old. It's extremely cute. You want to take him home. Having Islam take over your country is like falling into a dam full of fully grown crocodiles somewhere in the Kruger National Park. It's a big difference between the two. And if we as Christians don't know the difference, we can't be careful about the spread of Islam. Okay. So I actually have two jokes, but I can't tell them now because I'm on a serious road. Please remind me to sell, tell the jokes at the end because it's religious jokes, but I don't want to forget. So remind me when I finish off. Now, you might say, oh, Heinrich, you know, other religions doesn't really bother me because, you know, I live in a Christian country and I'm Christian and my neighbors is, are Christian and my colleagues are Christian. Oh, this is really irrelevant. Rather, I should have gone this morning to cappuccinos. They have bottomless coffee. 
They are actively busy amalgamating the major religions of the world. If you want information, I'll send it to you. You can find it on Google. Go on Google. In 2022, when is that? Next year. They'll be opening in Abu Dhabi the One World Religion Headquarters. If you can't see Revelation unfolding in front of your eyes, there's a problem. It will be called the Abrahamic Family House. It will consist of three buildings, a church, a synagogue, and a mosque together. And it will be there to promote peace. And the treaty to do this was signed by Sheikh Ahmed al tayyib and our wonderful Pope Francis to start a one world religion headquarters. One condition for the church that will be built, it may not have a cross on top. Because crosses, public display of crosses, is against the law in the UAE. So there already is an equality. Good. So, now let me first take you to a few scriptures and then we'll discuss the detail of Islam. Matthew 24, 4, 5, Lord Jesus is chatting, speaking. He says, and Jesus answered them and said to them, take heed. That no one lead you astray. And he's talking, Matthew 24, 25, he's talking about the end times. He says, many shall come in my name, saying that I am the Christ, and many people shall be led astray. 2 Peter 2, 1. Peter says, but there as there arose false prophets among the people of Israel, so there shall be many false teachers arising among you, the Christians bringing destructive heresies, denying even the mastership and the lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, if I tell you that Muhammad and Buddha and Jesus is the same, then I'm denying the lordship of Jesus Christ. This is happening in our time. 1 John 2, a few weeks back, a few weeks, a few months back, we did a sermon about Revelation. Do you remember? 1 John 2, the apostle John says, My little children... It is the last hour, means the last stretch of time. He says, you heard the Antichrist is coming. And now there are already many Antichrists manifesting. Do you remember when I said the Antichrist is a spiritual movement of the last time? And you will get many Antichrists and then you will get the Antichrist. Who will be the world leader sitting down in the temple in Jerusalem and declaring himself God. There are many antichrists over the last 2,000 years, and in my opinion, Muhammad was one of them. Because what does an antichrist do? They deny, if you read the rest of 1 John, please go and read the chapter. You read the rest of 1 John 2. Antichrist denies Jesus as the Son of God, denies his relationship with the Father, and denies that he's the Savior. And that's exactly what Muhammad did. Muhammad is one of the Antichrists. Not the Antichrist, but he was one of the major Antichrists over the last 200 years. 1 Timothy 6.12 says, Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold of eternal life. Remember three months back, I had this verse in a, in a scripture, in a sermon, that to be truly saved, you need to fight the good fight of faith. Remember me saying that? I got a Caving message on a Monday on that Monday morning from someone about my statement. To be truly saved, that salvation must become such a reality in your heart that you fight the good fight of faith. And fighting the good fight of faith means then standing up against falsehood and that which is not true. We're not called to hug and kiss everybody, except during peace. We call to stand up for the truth of the gospel. So let's go to Islam. Muhammad was born in the 6th century in the, in, the, in the Arabian Peninsula in Mecca. He started his ministry in 610 AD in Mecca and it later sp uh, uh, spread to Medina, which he conquered by the sword and killed about two-thirds of the inhabitants. At the age 
Now I'm speaking on a correction. I think he was about 30, 25, 30 years old. He started getting visitations from a supernatural being, according to his own notes or his own writings about him. He started receiving visitations from a supernatural being, which he first believed was a demon. And he tried more than once to end his life. Then his wife, which was about quite a bit older than him, said to him, no, no, no. Maybe it's God speaking to you. Start noting what is said to you. And that's how he started writing the Quran. And he later called this being the angel Gabriel. But he also said the angel Gabriel was the same as the Holy Spirit. So I think somewhere Muhammad got his things crossed. So what he wrote in the Quran was the revelations from this spiritual being. He started spreading his gospel. His gospel, his good news. And nobody wanted to listen or start following him. And he did the second best thing and he took out his sword. And he started spreading Islam in the Arabian Peninsula by the sword. He, and this is all in their religious documents. I'm not making it up because this is an anti-Islam sermon. This is all noted. He started raiding caravans to get money to spread his gospel. So through attack, Killing, pillaging, he got the money to spread his message. So let's go to the Crusades. Who likes the Crusades? You. So hopefully you'll be able to add something. Now, the gospel, uh, um, the, the story of Islam spread, spilled out of the, Mediter uh, the Arabic Peninsula. And the next 600 years, from 548... AD, or from, from he started preaching, until the 11th century. How many years is that? 600. Islam committed 548 jihads against this Christian world. What's a jihad? A holy war. To capture and eliminate or convert by the sword the infidel. That's you and me. Interestingly enough, I will be using the word infidel, but interestingly enough, the K word, that's against the law in our country, is the Arabic word for infidel. So we are Ks as far as they're concerned. That is the word written in the Quran for infidel. Okay, so there was 548 attacks against Western and East, uh, Eastern, Western Europe and North Africa. Over a million white slaves were taken into captivity. Christian slaves. From all the coastal areas. The word slave comes from the word Slavic, which is the Eastern European people. Over a million slaves were taken in five, six hundred years. Uncountable people were killed, raped and pillaged in that time. Then finally in the 11th century... Now, this is a Pope I can have respect for. Pope Urban III, second, declared a holy war against Islam and the whole of Europe united to fight back. Incidentally, who's ever been to Austria? Islam was stopped at the gates of Vienna. That's how far they progressed. A big, large piece of Spain were Islam. Many of the Greek islands and Greece were Islam. So thank God for the Crusades or your and my forefathers would have ended up being Muslims. So the whole Europe united and they had this saying called Dios Vult. Who have heard it? Dios Vult. God ordains it. That was their saying for the Crusades. And they drove Islam back. And they went as far as Israel. And they recaptured Israel and Jerusalem. That was the first crusade. It lasted about a hundred years. There were four more. The purpose of the crusades, because you get today very woke, liberal, white Christians who tells us we must be ashamed of the crusades because there was atrocities done. I'm sure there was atrocities done. If you take 200 fighting shoulders, there will always be atrocities from individuals. doesn't matter who or what they are. But the purpose and the main aim of the crusades were actually, in my opinion, very sacred and holy. They formed the kingdom of Jerusalem, and you'll find that many European monarchs still today in their long titles, they'll be the king of Jerusalem. 
And that's because somewhere they had a link to the ruling kings of Jerusalem a thousand years back. That's where the night started. Many clergy became soldiers and vice versa. Many soldiers became clergy, like the Templar Knights and the Hospitaller. Hospitaller? What we, what's, yeah. the, what's the right word? Hospitaller. Hospitaller Knights and uh, all those groups of knights. They were both soldiers and clergy at the same time. There's a difference between a jihad and a crusade. A jihad is to conquer the infidels. A crusade was to take back Christian land and honor and give freedom to Christian people. So please be proud about the crusades. It was a holy event. So there we have Islam spreading all across the world, all the, called the Mediterranean area. The books of Islam. Now, I can do 20 sermons about Islam. I'm really condensing it to, to, to pit course. What's English for pit course? The essence of things you need to know. I can spend, like I said, 10 sermons on this. The books of, 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 of Islam. Firstly, you all know the Quran. That, that's the writings of the revelations that, that Muhammad got from the spiritual being. Then you have the Hadith, which is the biography of Muhammad, his life story, written about by his, I think, his uncle. Then you have the Sunnahs, which is the ancient traditions of Islam. Then you have the Sahih al-Bukhari, which is the early traditions. And all these books are valid. They don't have one book like us. We have one book. They have many books to guide them through life. Now, this is something you must really understand very clearly. We have an old and a new covenant. Remember last, last time we had the sermon about the Old and the New Covenant and that why God was stricter in the Old Covenant than in the New Covenant? Do you remember? Although God's character hasn't changed and we, we, we reflected on that. Islam doesn't have different covenants. Islam is one religion written probably over the period of 30 to 50 years by, by um, Muhammad and his family members and his generals, all the different books. And every statement in those books are applicable to a Muslim. It's not like us that we say in Leviticus, uh, if, if uh, a virgin sleeps with somebody, you take her out and you stone her. That was ancient, ancient uh, law. It's changed in the New Testament. It's nothing like that in the New Covenant. For Islam, it doesn't. Everything is applicable that you read for every Muslim. In our Bible, we have narratives, meaning the story of Abram, uh, Jacob, Abram, Isaac, and Jacob. We have the story of Daniel. We have narratives of godly people, and from that we draw inspiration and guidance. Islam has do's and don'ts. Do this, don't do this. Do this, don't do this. Do this, don't do this. So when you, when you go like this, any, mini, miny, mo, through the Quran, and you go, oh, and you read, it's applicable. It's not a question of what's the, what's the context. context and who are they talking about. It's the statement of Muhammad. It's applicable. Okay. So, let's quickly reflect on political Islam. And I'm going to take the UAE as an example. Who have been to the UAE? Good. Now, let me also just remind you, if you've been to a country on holiday and have stayed in an air-conditioned hotel... Like I have, I've, I've been to, I've been to Mozambique. <laughs> Doesn't mean because I've lived in, in, in the, uh, what's the Pulana? Pulana Hotel in Mozambique? Doesn't mean I know the tradition of the Mo Mozambique people. So even if you've been to the UAE, let me tell you, you don't know what it is to live under political Islam. It's, like I said, it's illegal in the UAE to display a cross in public. To pro pros proselytizing people, it's a criminal offense. You can tell me what proselytizing is. It's a big word for a Dutch boy. What's proselytizing? Converting people to Christianity. Preaching the gospel and converting people as a criminal offense in the UAE. You get locked up for it. Andrew, can I ask you one question? Yes, please. Who wrote all those laws in Islam? Was it 
actually Muhammad, or was it some of his friends or people that came after him? There's, there's the, the Quran. Yeah. It says that his wife written it. He dictated it and his wife written it. He had many wives. His, oh, his, his first wife, the older wife, wrote all the, the notes for him. But something like the Adif and the Sidi Abu Khari was like his uncle and one of his generals and people yeah, that so knew him. Different. Yeah, uh, okay. yeah. But it always was about what Muhammad did and what Muhammad said. and what. So it's, it's, he's, Muhammad is seen as the perfect man. We'll get to that later. He's the perfect man for a, for a, for a Muslim. Okay. Um, pro proselytizing is against the law. You can be put in five years in jail or something like $86,000 um, penalty. Is that a lot of money? $86,000. Yeah. Yeah, that's a lot of money. Sharia law, the religious law is the national law. You know this about the Islamic countries. Hey, the Sharia law is the national law. Okay. And corporal punishment and executions are part of Sharia law. Okay, that's political Islam. Let me take you to a few what I call shocking verses in Islam. And as I said, don't come afterwards and say, Heinrich, but you put, took things out of context. There is only one context in Islam. Muhammad said it or Muhammad did it, obey. That's the context. They have a concept of brigation, which means the older verses, I don't know whether the verses he wrote or the last few uh, in the last few chapters of, of, of his Quran has more authority than the first verses. And if you've read through the Quran, and I have, I have an Afrikaans Quran at home, you see that he becomes more and more militant. He becomes more and more angry as he goes on. The latest verses, so what, what the Muslims will very, very often do is to defend their faith. They'll, they'll quote a verse from chapter 3. That's about kindness and love. But don't tell you about the verse in chapter 20 that says, kill all infidels. So the later verses have more authority. A concept of taqwa. Taqwa is accepted practice in Islam that it's perfectly okay to deceive non-believers and lie to them. To promote your faith and your own, your own prosperity. We are taught to, be to lie and deceit is wrong, doesn't matter who you do it to. In Islam, non-believers have no rights. Taqwa, to lie and deceive non-believers. A fatwa, what's a fatwa? It's when an imam, thank heavens, pastors and women don't have that authority, is when an imam declares you an enemy of the Muslim people and there's a bounty on your head, then anybody can kill you and it's a righteous act. And any imam can declare a fatwa on someone if they're not happy with you. Since um, Sadia Bukhari, chapter 73, says, just, just, just listen to what the statement makes, and, and you tell me that there isn't something very evil in this, in this religion. It says, Allah says, I personally call him Allah Bala, but I won't here. <laughs> Allah says that the most awful name anyone can carry is the name King of Kings. Where do we find the name King of Kings? In the Bible. I think Allah don't like it because he's on the losing team. Surah 354 says Allah is the best liar and deceiver there is. The Hadith, volume 5, chapter 59. Muhammad is asked whether one of his followers can lie to the infidels to get victory over them. And he says, yes, go ahead, that's fine. It's a righteous thing to do. In the Yusia Bukhari, volume 6, chapter 60, Muhammad says, fight till there's no one left on earth except those who serve Allah. In the Quran, chapter 2 and 10, in the early part of the Quran, Muhammad actually says, if you are unsure about anything I have written, go ask the people of the book. That's us, Christians. Because they have truth in their Bible as well. But modern Muslims will tell you that the Bible has been corrupted. They can't tell you when and where, but they say, mm -mm. since Muhammad wrote this, your Bible was corrupted. Strangely, the Bible was written 300 years before the Muhammad was born, but that's beside the point.
Quran chapter 551, it says, Never take an infidel as a friend. <coughs> they say in the Quran that when the Messiah comes, in my opinion, that will be the, the Antichrist. When the Messiah comes, he will destroy all churches and he will destroy the cross. There's a few difficult verses and I'm going to be as, as is the word tactile? No. Sensitive as I can. Quran chapter 65 verse 4. Muhammad says that to violate pre-pubescent girls as long as they're infidels, it's not a problem. There's nothing wrong with it. Yes, he did. We'll get to that. We'll get to that f sad fact. Quran 4 verse 3 says, yes, you may own slaves. You might say to me, Heinrich, we fight slavery in the Bible. Yes, we do. But then you get like the letter of Philemon to Philemon where Paul says, Onesimus, Onesimus, your slave that ran away, I'm sending him back. But realize he's not only your slave, he's now your brother as well. We don't have that in the Quran. In North Africa and the Mediterranean, slavery is still thriving. Go and Google it if you think I'm talking nonsense. Still thriving. Um, Quran 4.34. It says it's okay to beat your wife, but there's specific guidelines of how many, how many blows and when you may beat her. Quran 24.13. says for a female to prove a case of rape against a perpetrator... She needs four male witnesses. Quran 33.57 says, Those who insult Muhammad must be killed. Who is that? Um, that comic? French one. Yeah, uh, where they, where they, they draw a cartoon of Muhammad? Charlie Hebdo. And a um, and, and, and Muslim came in and killed how many people there? Just executed them. It's against the law to make fun of uh, from uh, Muhammad. Quran 9, 111. Kill all infidels. Quran 489. Kill for all apostates. Who's an apostate? Somebody who believed in Islam and then turned away or become a Christian is an apostate. Kill all apostates. Um, it's also said uh, in Sadia Bukhari, volume 7, chapter 62, he refers to infidel woman that is caught in war. Infidel woman that is caught in war, it's called women of your right hand, and they can become your slaves and your objects you use for gratification. They have no rights. That's why so many European countries that have now all these immigrants will tell you that they have an incredible surge in rape. Because an infidel, infidel woman has no right under Islam. She's there for whatever pleases you. Have you heard enough about Islam? Let me just point out, strangely enough, our Bible teach a relationship with God. You and God. Yeah, now and again it will refer to the, to the heathen and the unbelievers, but it's about you and God. Whoopsie, whoopsie. Nothing broke. 64% of the Quran, 81% of the Sadia Bukhari, and 37% of the Hadith are what you must do with the infidels and not their own religion. Let's talk about the perfect man, Muhammad. Muhammad Ali was his full name. The perfect man, Muhammad Ali. There are many scriptures in their writings that actually says he was a fair blonde hair man. Did he start off as a Christian? They perceive him, yes. That's why he started writing in the beginning of the Quran. He speaks about Abraham and John the Baptist and Moses. And, and then later on he becomes more and more militant, yes. Most probably he did start off as a Christian, and that's why it makes him a perfect antichrist, because John said those who were in the church will leave and then start denying Jesus Christ as the Son of God. He captured a nine-year-old girl, girl called Aisha. She became his favorite wife. 
He, she was captured at the age of six, and he consummated the marriage at the age of nine. That's why in Muslim countries, bride wives is not an issue. You can marry a, a girl of nine. He was 50 and she was nine. Okay, I don't know if I should say the last three because they're quite... Um, Sadia Bukhari, 1183, I'm going to be very cryptic. He, uh, it's written here that he used underage children for, 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 for needs when he wasn't at home, boys and girls. Sadia Bukhari, 5068, he had nine wives, and it's noted that he would only bath when he goes to the mosque. And the weekends he would spend with his nine wives, and he would only bath at the end when he goes to the mosque. That's a perfect man. I'm ending off with this before I say a few interesting things. Aisha wrote, Aisha wrote that she had quite a time keeping his clothes clean, keeping his outfits clean from seed, because he used his wives and all the women of his right hand on a regular basis. And it was her full-time effort to keep his clothes clean. A few interesting facts. Do you still think Muhammad is the perfect man? To be aspired to and to live up to? I've given you a fraction of what there is in their documents. And it's not anti-Islam rhetoric. It's from their writings. Interesting facts. He started off very pro-Christian, as, as, as um, Mary Lou said. In the Quran. And if, please, if you're interested, let me know. Send me a WhatsApp. I'll send you this video. I have a lovely video of an imam who started questioning certain things in the, in, the, in, the, in the Quran. Question it. And the Quran led him to Jesus. And this is the following things he said. He said, Muhammad's name is four times in the Quran. The name of Jesus is 25 times. He says, the only woman referred to in the Quran is Mary, the mother of Christ. He says, Jesus is referred to as the Word of God, the Spirit of God, the Christ. He is alive while Muhammad is dead. It is, he healed many sick. He resurrected the dead. Muhammad did nothing like that. There's, yeah, there's a story of, 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 of Jesus as a child in the, in the Quran. Whether it's true or not, I think it's very cute. He was sitting on the Sabbath making little, playing with clay or with mud. Now, I only made mortar cookies. <laughs> but it said that he was sculpting a little bird from, from the mud. A little, little bird in his hands. And a rabbi walked past and said to him, You're not allowed to work on the Sabbath. Why are you molding this thing on a Sabbath? And he blew onto the bird and it came alive and fluttered away. He said, I've done nothing wrong. Where's, what are you talking about? Whether it's true or not. And all these things in the Quran brought this imam to Jesus. So if you're interested, let me know. I will send that to you. My brothers and sisters, we live in a time, as I said in the beginning, where people tell you that Allah is just a different name for God. It's not. They will tell you that don't worry about the Quran because it refers to Jesus and it refers to, to Abraham and it refers to John the Baptist. Do yourself a favor and go and buy a Quran. You can buy it in any place, Afrikaans or English. The references to those people are not at all biblical. What he says about Jesus, and this is why I say, and I make it on a recording. So, yeah, if I get into trouble for this, it's fine, because I'll stand up for my Lord. Why I believe that Islam is nothing more than a demonic religion. He denies that Jesus is the Son of God. He denies that Jesus died on the cross. He says that, that Jesus just ascended into heaven. You cannot be saved through the blood of Jesus. And that the sign of the cross is actually an evil sign. And when the real Messiah comes, he will break every cross on earth. There's nothing between Christianity and Islam that's the same. And I say again, that doesn't mean if you meet a Muslim tomorrow, be rude to them. It's not what I'm saying. They are pleasant, kind, I suppose good-hearted individuals in Islam as well. But do not be fooled by the dogma of Islam. And do not be fooled by the political aggression and the danger of Islam taking over in any area. Amen and Amen.